suspended for not wearing masks in schools. That's what students in one Virginia school face when a judge ruled mask mandates can remain. His ruling came after Governor Glenn Youngkin's executive order making masks optional. Tara Mergener reports from Loudoun County on the ongoing tug of war over masks and Virginia's new bill to end mandates. Virginia's House and Senate approved a bill ending school mask mandates, but the default date for new laws to go into effect is July 1. So Governor Youngkin is set to send the bill back to the House to add an emergency clause, making it effective immediately. We wanted to give you a behind the scenes look of what parents and students of one school system had to encounter to get to this point. Hi, my name is Madeline and I like running. My name is Brayden and I like to do sports. My name is Joshua and I like my family. What seven-year-old Joshua, 10-year-old Brayden, and 13-year-old Madeline don't like is being suspended, along with a dire warning Madeline says came from her principal. They said it will go on my record and they said it could affect my when I go to college. These Loudoun County students are among 29 who showed up unmasked after Virginia's new governor nixed mask mandates in schools last month. Welcome news to the Platts who say masks give Madeline headaches, make it hard for Brayden to understand his teachers and aggravate Joshua's breathing. It made my asthma worse. What was that like? Um, it made me not feel like I was breathing. They don't talk about anxiety. They, they don't talk about health. They don't talk about the long-term impact of, of what this does to children. But the relief from Youngkin's announcement didn't last long. The siblings returning to school only to learn they're banned from their classrooms. They took us to the library and kept us in there for seven hours. Whenever a class came in, they told us, told the class not to talk to us. Isolated from their masked peers. We were even being supervised. It was just us in this little conference room in the back of the office. And left to and learn on their own. It's quarter three, we're learning new things. Like, I have to watch YouTube tutorials. Loudon is among dozens of Virginia school districts still enforcing mask mandates. How do they become the executive branch? of the law. We're like, when can they come for their in-person education that they're entitled to by the Virginia um, state law? And all they tell them, they're like, as soon as they put the mask on. These school systems could be on shaky legal ground, according to constitutional expert Brad Jacob. The Constitution says that the uh, government, including the public schools, may not deny the equal protection of the laws. And so you have to make sure as a school that you are treating the students equally, that they are all getting the same opportunities. Lisa Harcrow says not only is Loudon going against the governor's edict, but in her son's case, doctor's orders. They Right now they're stating that if they approve one medical exemption, that they're going to start having to approve them all. And some parents insist school officials are breaking their own rules. For example, invited guests have been seen partially or unmasked during the same time frame students were getting suspended. <laughs> LCPS denied our request for an interview and emailed us this statement saying in part, because this issue is currently the subject of litigation, it would be inappropriate for the superintendent to comment. Meanwhile, the Platts and others now on the outside looking in. As parents, um, what's going on, it's fundamentally and unlawfully wrong. And these Loudoun County parents believe their children have a right to an education, Gordon, even without a mask. Tara, um, in addition to saying it's going to be part of your permanent record, there were reports that children without masks on school grounds could be arrested. Where, where did that report come from? How did the school board respond to that? Well, it seems like there were a number of sources to cause concern about this. Now, I should point out first that the superintendent, Scott Ziegler, did send around an email saying that school officials do not have the authority to arrest children or their parents for trespassing. But at the same time, I'm told there were words exchanged at the various schools, and there was an audio recording even of an elementary 
principal, assistant principal, that uh, told parents in this recording, someone recorded it, obviously, I don't think she know, knew anybody was listening, um, that they would be arrested, that they would face trespassing charges if they showed up at school without a mask. And they add to that an internal staff email that was circulating that said, quote, the safety and security coordinator will proceed to the magistrate to swear out a trespass summons and a warrant. So while school officials saying, are, no, 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 we don't have the right to arrest you or your child for trespassing, it seems there was a lot of conflicting signals going out. And certainly a lot of parents were very concerned and it was quite the scuttlebutt. Well, I, I just know they do have the power to uh, arrest as, uh, trespassers, and that's how they keep the school safe. If, if you don't belong in that school, you, you don't get to roam the halls. Uh, how long will it take for the governor's emergency clause to go into effect? Well, it looks like it's going to go pretty quickly. Yesterday, Governor Youngkin actually went to the House floor to signal how quickly he wants it to go and to confirm that he does want this emergency clause. So what has to happen now is got to be approved again by the House and the Senate. The Senate, of course, is led by Democrats. Last time, three joined Republicans in voting for this bill. But the expectation is that the final votes could happen as early as next week. Both clerks have said it can be approved with a simple majority vote, though there is some talk that that might be challenged. Well, uh, let's talk about Loudoun County. So if the bill does pass, <laughs> is Loudoun County School Board actually going to abide with the new law? Well, I have to tell you, when I talk to these parents, there's a lot of concern about that because obviously when Governor Youngkin did the executive order the last time, Loudoun is among these school districts who did not comply. The sense is they could still find some way to push back, although I think this time around it sounds like it's going to be a lot more difficult. A lot of parents are super upset because they say already, even when this goes into effect, you know, the kids have been out now over a week, so they're growing more and more concerned. But definitely they do favor the emergency clause and hoping to get their kids back to school as quickly as possible with as little as drama as possible, Gordon. All right, Tara. Thanks for the reporting. In other news, Russia claims it's pulling back some of its troops on Ukraine's border. The United States and European officials say all signs point to an invasion. John Jessup has more from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? That is right, Gordon. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson says Europe is on the edge of the precipice. As news reports suggest, anywhere between 130 to 150,000 Russian troops surrounding Ukraine. Moscow, though, is sending a different message. CBN's George Thomas reports from Lviv, Ukraine. Russia's Ministry of Defense says that while large-scale military exercises are continuing across the country, troops that have been deployed to the southern and western districts are beginning to move back. The ministry has released video reportedly showing armored tanks and other equipment being loaded onto trains. The reports of a withdrawal comes as the United States continues to insist that Russia is on the verge of launching a full-scale invasion. The high-stakes efforts to calm tensions continue. Germany's chancellor, who was just here in Ukraine yesterday, is headed to Moscow today for talks with Vladimir Putin. Meanwhile, residents here in Lviv, Ukraine's largest city in the western part of the country, are getting an unexpected holiday tomorrow. Ukraine's president has declared February 16th, cited as a possible invasion day, as Unity Day. And he's urging his countrymen to get out the blue and yellow flag and to fly it proudly. George Tower, CBN News, Lviv, Ukraine. Thank you, George. Meanwhile, the United States and other nations are urging their citizens to leave Ukraine. Israel going one step further. As CBN's Chris Mitchell reports from Jerusalem, the Jewish state is making plans to help not only Israeli citizens, but thousands of Ukrainian Jews who may be caught in the crossfire. On Sunday, Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett called on Israelis in Ukraine to leave. I am calling again upon Israelis in Ukraine, come home. Don't take unnecessary risks. Don't wait for a situation where you really want to come back, but it will be impossible. Be responsible for yourselves, leave Ukraine as quickly as possible, and come home. But Israel is concerned not only for its citizens, but also for the tens of thousands of other Jews in Ukraine. Former Israeli ambassador to the UN, Danny Danone, is involved in that effort. So I have been in touch with, with the leadership uh, 
uh, of the Jewish communities in Ukraine. They are confused about their future. Uh, we told them the gates of Israel are always open for every Jew to come. But Danone says even in the face of an invasion, it's a difficult decision. But you know, it's not easy to relocate your family when you have a connection to your community, a job, elderly parents. It's not easy for them to come and just pack their things and, and move to Israel. Yael Eckstein, head of the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews, just spent time on the ground in Ukraine. I felt all of the unknown of what will be in the future there, but what was very clear to me is that there's a thriving and strong Jewish community in Ukraine that isn't going anywhere so quickly. In February 2020, CBN News accompanied 130 Ukrainian Jews who made Aliyah to Israel. Even now, the work goes on. Continuing our operations, rain or shine, no matter what's going on. And there are those who have always dreamed about making Aliyah and are jumping on this time now to move to Israel. The state of Israel has a long history of rescuing Jews during dangerous times. With well over 100,000 Russian troops on the border of Ukraine, the Jews in Ukraine may seek Israel's experience in their hour of need. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Thank you, Chris. Gordon, back to you. Well, the last time Russia invaded Ukraine, it wasn't that long ago, but well, let's, let's keep in mind what happened in Crimea. Uh, there were refugee camps created for the, the Jews of Ukraine. Uh, the persecuted community has been for a long time. You go back to World War II and the Holocaust, uh, Ukraine was incredibly efficient at wiping out uh, the Jewish people in, in, in their borders. And so for them to be survivors, they're quite proud of that, and they're quite proud of their Ukrainian heritage, and they want to stay. They've been in those refugee camps. It looks like it's getting even worse. I applaud Israel for saying, yes, please come home, but I also understand why they would want to stay. Deadly strokes, heart disease, Alzheimer's, all these diseases and more can be linked to high levels of uric acid. Well, it's easy to monitor and control your level of uric acid for better health. CBN medical reporter Lori Johnson explains. When you visit the doctor for your annual physical, chances are you'll get your blood tested. Usually that includes a check of your uric acid level to see if you're at risk for the arthritic condition called gout. New research now shows too much uric acid in the body may also predict other, more serious conditions. This is not your grandfather's uric acid. This has far more implication uh, than simply being a, a risk marker for gout. In his book, Drop Acid, Dr. David Perlmutter cites a massive study that followed 90,000 adults for eight years. Individuals in the group with the highest uric acid had a 15% increased risk of death. That number grew to 35% for death from stroke and a 39% increased risk from a heart event. When it comes to brain health, a 12-year Japanese study showed similar cause for concern. Those individuals with the highest level of uric acid had an 80% increased risk of dementia, a 55% increased risk of specifically Alzheimer's, and a 166% increased risk for what is called mixed or vascular blood supply dementia. So it's very real, it's very important, very threatening uh, to the brain. Dr. Perlmutter says the ideal level for uric acid should be lower than 5.5. About 100 years ago, the average uric acid level in humans totaled about 3.3. Now it's greater than 6. Your doctor can test your uric acid levels. It's also easy to use one of these home uric acid monitors every couple of weeks until you've met your goal, then once a month after that. If you need to drop your level, Dr. Perlmutter recommends two supplements found at health stores, quercetin, 500 milligrams a day, and luteolin, 100 milligrams a day. These two are pretty darn effective in terms of lowering uric acid. Uric acid forms when our bodies break down alcohol, seafood, and fructose, so keep these in check. When it's packaged in fruit, that's where the name comes from, fructose, fruit sugar, uh, it's actually relatively safe and has no impact on uric acid if we don't consume an excess amount of fruit. Yes, 
an, an apple a day keeps the doctor away, but five, ac- uh, five apples a day and the doctor you'll pay, meaning you can overdo it. Fruit juices are loaded with fructose, as are most processed foods. The granddaddy of them all is high fructose corn syrup, an ingredient we've often talked about on the 700 Club. This high fructose corn syrup as a sweetener has even more fructose than typically table sugar. Table sugar is 50-50 glucose and fructose, but high fructose corn syrup is even sweeter, has much more fructose. In addition to paying attention to what we eat and drink, we can also lower our uric acid by focusing on when we eat. Using intermittent fasting, where you don't eat for about 14 hours in a row, should cause your levels of uric acid to go down. In other words, having dinner, finishing dinner at six, seven, eight o'clock, and then not eating until, you know, eight or nine or 10 o'clock the next morning. Finally, strive for a good night's sleep. One study showed a substantial rise in uric acid levels in people with sleep apnea, a condition where a person's breathing repeatedly stops and starts. A sleep study and treatment for that condition, however, can set things straight. So check your uric acid levels and strive for 5.5 or less. You can get there by making some small changes that could make a big difference. Lori Johnson, CBN News. Well, that's great information. I encourage you to manage and control your uric acid. And if you want more information, the book is called Drop Acid, and you can find it wherever books are sold. There. Phil Robertson could very well be one of the first victims of modern-day cancel culture. After quoting the Bible during an interview, Phil was suspended from Duck Dynasty. Several sponsors pulled their ads from the hit show. The PC crowd demanded an apology. Still, Phil didn't back down. And rather than be silenced, he's now more vocal than ever. New York Times bestselling author and Duck Dynasty star Phil Robertson says our country is deeply divided. He is concerned about America and what will become of our republic over the next few months and years. Phil says our broken culture has forgotten how to have respectful conversations and often suppresses conservative opinions and biblical values. In his book, Uncanceled, Phil shares how to find meaning and peace in a culture of accusations, shame, and condemnation. Well, Phil Robertson joins us now via Skype. Phil, we welcome you back to the 700 Club. Hey, coming out of the deep woods of Louisiana. (laughs) We're so (laughs) glad you have. Let's go back, if you will, to your 2013 interview with that GQ reporter. Did you ever imagine that level of backlash from your comments? Well, everyone who lives a godly life in Christ Jesus we will be persecuted. Mm. So I accept the persecution. Actually, uh, it, it brings forth me to point them to Jesus more mm-hmm. when they begin to cancel their neighbor for no good reason. Yeah. And it's, uh, yeah. it's a sad thing to watch. Uh, I'm not mad at them. Uh, I'm sad for them because there is one lawgiver and one judge, the one that can both save and destroy. It's a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. I point them to Jesus. Jesus died for the sins of the world, including theirs, the ones who go around canceling people. But uh, God's not going to take this lying down, so judgment is coming for all of us. So I just point them to Jesus. I don't hold it against them when they bad mad me or curse me. Remember when Jesus was on the cross, I mean, they had brutalized him and treated him like an animal. He strung up on a cross. His final words were, forgive them, Father. They don't know what they're doing. So I keep that in mind when I have people who attack me for good, no, no reason. Well, you noted that cancel culture is nothing new, but it is a little bit, more than a little bit, pronounced these days. Why is that? Here's the, here's the exact answer. Since they did not, get, not think it worthwhile 
to retain the knowledge of God. God gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not to be done. They become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They're gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. And here's a, a, a encompassing picture of the world when the Roman Empire was there, and now we're in the American Empire. I'm saying nothing has changed. They are senseless, faithless, no Jesus, heartless, try to ruin their neighbor, and they are ruthless. They rip children out of their mother's wombs. So when you look at it, that's Romans chapter 1, about verse 28 and following. You read that and you say, all these empires that have come up, all of them, going all the way back to Mesopotamia, and you just start moving forward. I had a college professor give me all the empires. I said, what happened to them? He said, every one of them collapsed, leading up to, here we are with China, Russia, America, India. There's a few empires still standing. These are the newest ones. You say, what will happen to them based on their lack of knowledge of God? They will, we will go the way of the rest of them. They all have one thing in common. They collapse. So it worries me, and I'm trying to get my fellow American to say, what in the world are we doing? We ran God out of our schools. These Ivy League schools, colleges, they started out as preaching schools, seminary schools, Bible verses on the gates when you came in. I mean, that's a couple hundred years ago. Look at us now. Yeah. yeah. I, one of the things I, I really would like you to address is that you say it's not just the left trying to cancel others, that evangelical Christians have been guilty of this same transgression. How so? Who is he that cancels his brother? Who is he who passes judgment on his, on his brother? Listen to this. This is Romans chapter 2. And boy, it's a doozy. Don't ever fall victim to the, to be this way. Uh, you, therefore, have no excuse you who pass judgment on someone else. For at whatever point you judge someone else, you're condemning yourself because you who pass judgment do the same things. So even the what they call conservatives, even they are a little quick in passing judgment on others. Look, we're all sinners. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. So everyone, when they begin to sin, live a sinful life. I say junior high, high school years, the trouble starts. You say, what's the trouble? The trouble is we all begin to sin. All of us. God cancels us because our sins killed us. The wages of sin is death. He sends Jesus in flesh. He keeps the law. Everyone else that's ever lived had broken the law repeatedly. Just start with the top ten, you know. Start with obey your children, obey your father and mother. Start there. Murder, immorality, lying, stealing, lying, coveting. You're like, we can't even keep the top ten. So who are we to judge anybody because everyone is a sinner? So you have the saved that the book goes to. I'm writing to the saved. I'm saying, don't judge your neighbor. Leave room for God's wrath. The greatest commands in the Bible are love God with all your heart, mind, soul, strength. And the second one is like it, love your neighbor. If we do that, 
there is no downside. There's no downside to that. So don't judge your brother. God will do the judging. Just love God and love your neighbor. Think about what kind of like John Adams, the second president, spoke of a utopia we would have if we just loved God and loved our neighbor, for crying out loud. So here we are, and we're in the midst of the cancel culture. What we have is uh, America is a gigantic, and it's gigantic, a gigantic love deficit. Listen to this. This is the Apostle Paul to the church at Corinth because there was a lot of mischief going on in Corinth. Love is patient. We should all remember that. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not boast. Love is not proud. Love is not rude. Just think about this. Love is not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. But listen to this in the middle of the, for all the cancel crowd. Love keeps no record of wrongs. What if Jesus, our Lord, kept a record of our sins? Phil, you have always been so straightforward, a voice crying in the wilderness today, and may the people you're speaking to hear it. Your book is called Uncanceled. Phil Robertson, Finding Meaning and Peace in a Culture of Accusation, Shame, and Condemnation. And you can buy it nationwide. Phil, thank you for being with us, and thank you for being so straight on. We appreciate it. Bless you. I love you all. I love you all. We love you, too. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN Newsbreak. Canada's Prime Minister Justin Trudeau declared a national emergency to end the trucker protest over COVID restrictions. The emergency powers allow the government to tow cars and trucks, suspend their insurance, and even freeze truckers' personal and corporate bank accounts, as well as block donations to the protesters. The measures will last 30 days, and the military reportedly will not be involved. Well, a historic journey in the Middle East Monday, as Naftali Bennett became the first Israeli prime minister to publicly visit the Gulf Arab state of Bahrain. The visit sends a clear message of cooperation aimed at regional arch-rival Iran. The two countries signed a defense agreement just two weeks ago. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com. Gordon and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Betty's Restaurant is more than just a place where people can get a great Greek meal. It's also a ministry. Throughout the years, Betty has faced some tough economic times. Still, over the past decade, she tripled her business. Here's the secret ingredient to Betty's success. Always when you see people testimony, you know God is working out there. It gives you confirmation that in the little things, people in people's lives, he's come through. CBN partner Betty Kiriakidis watches The 700 Club every morning before heading into her 60-hour work week at the Greek restaurant she and her late husband opened 26 years ago. Her generous nature and love for Jesus are obvious to all that meet her. I think my desire to help people came when my mother and I in the mountains of Kentucky we used to go into the um, coal mining camps and dress little children for church, take them to Sunday school. We just did a lot of ministries up there in the Appalachian, and I learned about giving and people really in need. Over the years, Betty has loved CBN's focus on evangelism and humanitarian relief. She started supporting CBN in 2003. Having a daughter that's worked for the Salvation Army, I asked her, I said, if I wanted to donate to different ministries, and she tells me that Operation Blessing is one of the first to show up on the scene in disasters, and they were there till the end. In 2012, following a long illness, her husband passed away. She found comfort through her prayer warriors at CBN. When I was going through some rough times, I would call the 700 Club, and we would talk, and she would pray, and we would cry together and pray together, and it was very instrumental in helping me. Several years later, the restaurant faced tough times, and she was advised to sell the business and cut back on her giving. We've been through some difficult uh, economic things that happened, 
And I, I always just say, well, we'll get through it. With God's help, we'll get through it. I, I don't know how right now. We have to be faithful to him and he's faithful to us. Betty took out a personal loan against several rental properties and her son came on board with fresh menu ideas. Together, they worked hard and the restaurant more than recovered. God is just blessing us and especially during COVID and after COVID now, we're hitting numbers that we, we never hit before. And I think it's due to, to the blessings you know, that we're giving and we're still giving. As a restaurant, we do a lot of community outreach organization, helping people, and also it's our ministry. For regular customers, the Acropolis restaurant feels like a family. Betty loves the ministry opportunities she has there. She also has something for the children that come into the Acropolis. I'm an avid supporter of Superbook. I think if you get the gospel into children at an early age, it's planting a seed. And I always have an extra one in my purse. And when a child comes in, I say, I want you to see this little cartoon. It's good. When people ask Betty who she supports, she's quick to let them know. I do tell them about CB in Operation Blessing, and this is one uh, server I had, and her mother gave her up, and uh, I told her about Orphan's Promise. I said, now this should be close to your heart. Then I tell them also about CBN in general, because they do so much for so many. Today, the restaurant's business has tripled since 2012, and Betty attributes it all to God. I've never stopped giving back to God, because when you give to God, blessings come your way. You know, Betty has found the secret, can I just say, it's not about giving to get, it's about giving from your heart, and the blessing of God is just the part that comes after that. It's, it's the natural follow-up to your giving and caring about other people. To those of you who belong to the 700 Club, I want to say thank you, because Betty so eloquently stated, you're making, <clears throat> excuse me, a difference here at home and all around the world. 65 cents a day, $20 a month makes you a 700 Club member. So if you're watching this program today and you haven't yet joined, this is a great moment to go to your phone and call. You don't want to miss out on this opportunity. Our number is even toll free. It's 1-800-707-000. So many people in need and you can make a difference right from the comfort of your own home. It doesn't get better than that, right? When you call, will you do it using Pledge Express? Electronic monthly giving means the bank does all the work. There are lots of options for you to be able to call and, and become a 700 Club member. Can I show you those membership levels? General 700 Club membership, $20 a month, or you could join the, 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 the Gold Club, that's $40 a month, or the Thousand Club, $84 a month. We have 2,500 Club members, that's $2,500 a year, $209 a month, or our founders join us at $417 a month, that works out to $5,000 a year. Ask God what he'd have you do, and then go to your phone and call right now. Our way of saying thank you for caring about others is to send you Pat's latest book. It's called The Power of the Holy Spirit in You. Pat has walked this walk for many, many years, and he's seen the blessing in the hand of God. And he also shares with us how you can put the power of God to work in your own life. We all need that. So we send this to you as a thank you, and you have the privilege of knowing that you're touching and changing other lives. There's the number again. It's toll free. 1-800-700-7000. Call now. Just say, I want to join the 700 Club. Gordon? Partying with Kanye, working alongside Katy Perry and Paris Hilton. As a production designer in Hollywood, Beckett Cook was living the high life. Still, the, through all the glamour and glitz, he felt nothing but dead on the inside. I thought the whole purpose of my life, the meaning of my life, was finding true love in another human being and a guy, and finding in success in my career. So at a very young age, I knew that I was attracted to the same sex. I had to keep it to myself. I dated, you know, girls, and in elementary school, I went steady with girls. In high school, I dated girls. But it was all a facade. After college, I ended up moving to LA to pursue acting and writing and, and kind of a creative, more of a creative field. I just came out to everyone. That's when I fully embraced homosexuality as my identity. After each relationship with a guy and after it would end, I had total amnesia that it, how it all ended. 
And I would think, oh, the next guy is going to be perfect. And the next guy is going to be amazing. And of course, like two years later, it's over. You know, there's cheating, infidelity, and it's over. At this point in my life, I was very successful in my career as a set designer, production designer. I mean, I was doing covers for Vogue and for Harper's Bazaar, and I worked with a lot of pop stars like Katy Perry and Paris Hilton and Oprah, like everyone you can imagine. I worked with them, and I also started my own men's fashion line that was successful. Um, our clothes were in, you know, LA, New York, Paris. I went to all the shows, I went to all the after parties. I was at this one after party in Paris, and I remember just everyone was there from the fashion world. I think Kanye was there that year. And I was kind of looking out over the crowd. It just struck me so profoundly. I was like, is that all there is to life? Just going to parties for the rest of my life? Is that all? Is this what it's all about? And I really started to panic that night. I was overwhelmed with a sense of emptiness. Got back to LA and got busy with work for about six months. I was at a coffee shop in Silver Lake with my best friend, and he was gay too. And we noticed, shockingly, that there was a table next to us with Bibles on the table. This was the first time I had seen a Bible in public in Los Angeles, ever. And by that point in my life, I was, I was a practical atheist. Finally, I just turned around and I said, are you guys Christians? And they he just, they laid it out for me. They told me what they believe. They told me the gospel. So what does your church in Hollywood believe about homosexuality? And they were just like, well, you know, we believe it's a sin. And what's interesting about that is, number one, I, I appreciated how kind of frank they were and honest. They invited me to church the following Sunday. And I, I was like, I don't know if I'm going to go to your church, but I'll think about it. And then the following Sunday, I wake up and I'm like, I guess I'm just gonna go to this church today. The pastor comes out and he starts preaching on Romans chapter seven. Something strange started happening. Everything he was saying, every word he was saying, every sentence he was saying started to resonate as truth in my mind and my heart. And I didn't know why. I was on the edge of my seat, literally on the edge of my seat. It was the first time I had really heard the gospel and understood it. And before he left, he invited people to get prayed with on the side of the church. I go up to this guy, a stranger, and I say, I don't know what I believe, but I'm here. And he said, okay, let me pray for you. And he laid hands on me and prayed for me. It seemed really intense and long. And I just remember thinking, why does this straight dude love me so much? Because it seemed so loving what he was saying and praying. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit is just like, <laughs> like floods me. And God has revealed himself to me in that moment. And he's like, you're now adopted into my kingdom, welcome. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> and I just like started bawling hysterically bawling. In that moment, I knew in to the core of my being that being gay was no longer who I was, I, but I didn't care. Like I had just met Jesus Christ. Some people might say that I'm just suppressing who I really am, but they don't get it because, you know, I lived that life for a really long time. And I, I marched in gay pride parades. I, I marched in gay marriage equality parades. I was super gay. I tried that for 30 years. This is actually really who I am now. My hope is that people will realize how much more amazing it is to deny yourself and follow Christ rather than to just give in to sin now just to satisfy some Im immediate need. So it's not a happiness from the world, it's a joy that comes from Christ. With God, I feel this unconditional love from him that will never leave. Like he'll never leave or forsake me. I'm happy to leave that dead man behind because he's worth it.
You can be happy to leave that dead man behind. You can find joy. You can find peace. You can find purpose in life. You can find all of these things in him. It's what we were created to do. Um, it's so clear in Scripture, it's so clear from the writings of the church fathers that within each one of us uh, is this God-shaped hole. It, it doesn't ever get filled. The eternity in our hearts never gets filled until we fill it with the eternal one. Now, let me preach to you out of Romans chapter 7. That's what got Beckett's attention. And there's some real singular verses in that, and it, you kind of despair at life when you read Romans chapter 7, because the Apostle Paul is saying, and he's saying from himself, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things that uh, I shouldn't do, I find myself doing. And then this cry, and it's a heart cry, who can free me from this body of sin and death. Who can do that? And then he answers, I thank God for Christ Jesus. He had found the answer, the answer to every human need. Maybe you're like Beckett. Maybe you have same-sex attraction. You've been in that for a long time. Maybe you're heterosexual and you find yourself in serial relationships that you can't ever find any satisfaction in. Maybe for you, it's drugs, it's alcohol, it's money, it's power, it's position. Whatever it is that you find yourself trapped in, you already know it doesn't satisfy. It doesn't get you to a place of peace. You can do it over and over and over again, and it's never enough. Well, I've got great news for you. Jesus is real. He really is your Savior. He really does love you. He really walked the earth. He was really born from Mary. He died on a cross for you. Why? So that you wouldn't have to sacrifice. He made the sacrifice for all of us. And the reason he did that is because he loves you and he wants you to be with him for all eternity. The great dream that God had, that we would be his people. He would be our God. We would live in a garden, and we would have fellowship with him. That's what he wants. And when you find that fellowship, when you have him in your life, just like Beckett, when you're filled with his spirit, you're filled with his presence, well, then all the other things of this earth fade away. They all go away. Nothing compares to it. It's an experience. That's why people call it born again. It's like you're regenerated from the inside. Once I was blind, but now I see. And until you have that experience, you really don't know what it is all about. But here's some good news. You can have that experience and you can have it right now. Now, how do you get it? Well, you do the same thing Beckett did. He said, well, all right, I'll go to church. And then he went forward after the preaching about Romans 7, and somebody laid hands on him and prayed for him. And you hear the honesty. It was a long prayer. But at the end of that prayer, he got filled with the Spirit. Right now, let's pray together. You do the same thing. When you seek God, say, Jesus, if you're there, if you're really my Savior, if you really came for me, could you show me? Could you show up for me? If you pray that with all of your heart, he'll answer. So let's do that. Let's do it right now. Close your eyes. Bow your head. Let's pray that prayer. Jesus. Say it out loud. Jesus, if you're there, if you're my Savior, if you're real, come into my heart. Make me new. Let me have this experience. Let me be born again, renewed from my innermost being. Let me have joy in life. 
Let me have the life that you intended for me. And Jesus, if you do this for me, I want to follow you all the days of my life. Hear my prayer, for I pray it in Jesus' name. Father, for those who just prayed, I ask for a baptism in your love. I ask that you fill them to overflowing, that you lift up your face upon them, shine on them, and give them your peace. Be with them now, for I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed with me, there's one more thing I want you to do. I want you to let somebody know. The Bible says that when you believe in your heart and then you confess with your mouth, you shall be saved. We've made it easy for you. All you have to do is pick up the phone and call us. 1-800-700-7000. Now, when you call, I've got something absolutely free for you. It's called A New Day. In here is a CD teaching. You can also get it as a download if you don't have a CD player. Uh, it's all free. The packet's free. Phone call's free. It's how to live the Christian life. How do you know that your sins are forgiven? I want you to have it. It's yours. 1-800-700-7000. Here's a word from the Bible. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God.